Hey, hey, welcome to Half the Battle. You know, last week I was extremely harsh on the character of Psygout. Fair, but extremely harsh. But hey, I'm always willing to give second chances. That's why this week we're taking a look at the complete character of Psygout. Ah. Okay, a second chance might be more difficult than I thought, because his first figure looks like this. This is gonna hurt again, isn't it? Now, you might be saying, but Timmer, you chiseled genius, that doesn't look like the guy you showed us last week. Yeah, we'll get to that. This figure was released in 1987 with all original body parts. And if I was forced to use just one word to sum up this guy... I'd have to say... weird. From the bright green sweater over the chest plate to the strange headgear that has an antenna for some reason, you wouldn't think this guy was a soldier. An alien in a rather unconvincing disguise, sure, but not a soldier. There's an explanation for this, of course. This guy specializes in psychological warfare. He's a psychiatrist, and that's why he looks like that! His accessories continue the weirdness, as he's got a space alien backpack, and an, what, e-meter? Who the hell knows? And red dishes that strap to his arms. And like all psychiatrists, he also comes with a gun. Jesus, this must be what Scientologists actually believe a psychiatrist looks like. I will say, though, that the empty gun holster molded on his torso, to add to the effect when he's got it in his hand, is a nice touch. His second toy came out in 1988 as part of the Toys R Us exclusive Night Force line. And it's a huge improvement over the original. It's a straight repaint of the original version, like all of Night Force was really, with more subdued colors for night missions. You should know me well enough by now to know that I prefer subdued color schemes when it comes to my G.I. Joe figures. Subdued, but not bland or boring. And this is a perfect example of that. While the colors aren't flashy by any means, the toy itself is still visually really interesting. And they put him in actual army pants this time. There is one thing that's always bothered me when it came to these repaints for their sub-teams like Night Force and Tiger Force, though. They often feel the need to change the hair color. Which makes no sense story-wise. Hey, Frostbite, you're joining Tiger Force! Really? Better dye my hair ginger, then! I guess maybe Psych Out dyed his hair because as a blonde he would be too visible for a Night Force covert ops team. Now we come to the third and final figure, from 1991. And I can sum up my feelings about this guy in one clip. I am Locutus, a Borg. Resistance is futile. Your life, as it has been, is over. From this time forward, you will service us. Yeah, you all knew this was coming. This is the version we saw last week in the D cartoon. And no, I have no idea why they decided to make him look like he got lost on the way to a Star Trek convention. This figure was part of yet another sub-team, the Supersonic Fighters in this case. And I believe this is our first look at this particular gimmick team, the Sonic Fighters. Where to begin? Well, Hasbro figured that having toys that look great and are very movable just wasn't enough to keep the kids interested. Oh no, what they really needed was to make sounds. And so the Sonic Fighters were born. They thought to cleverly hide the sound technology inside the backpacks of the figures, making them practically invisible. Genius! Unfortunately, the less advanced miniaturization technology of that time meant that the backpacks ended up looking like this. It's hard to imagine in a time when we've got phone wristwatches, but this was the peak of early 90s technology. I will give these packs this, though. 
They're durable little bastards. They still work after like 25 years with the original batteries. But yeah, these guys ended up looking like they were hauling a bedroom closet on their backs. Not the most practical of things. I mean, they can barely stand up even with a figure stand. Just looking at this makes my back hurt. Anyway, the figure itself does have a few elements from the original. He's still got an antenna and removable saucers that vaguely remind me of the radar dishes on the first figure. I wish I could say more, but the whole idea of the figure is completely drowned out, because all you can focus on is thinking it's a freaking Borg. And those were all the toys of Psych Out from the original line. Except, of course, if you happen to live in Europe. Then you got a nice bonus. Meet Tiger Force Psych Out, exclusive to Europe and the United Kingdom. This figure was part of a small group of toys that were repainted for only that market. The toy itself is pretty meh. The Tiger Force coloring is okay, but nothing special. If this guy wasn't so rare, most people wouldn't give him a second look. Me, however, I freaking love this guy. And for a very special reason. I owe a large part of my collection to him. Back in the golden age of the flea markets of the late 90s and early 2000s, Tiger Force Psych Out was, for some reason, the most easy to find over here. And my American collector friends went absolutely nuts for him. So, back in the day, I set up quite a few trades with them. They'd get one rare European repaint, and I'd get a whole crapload of American figures, most of which that were never released in Belgium, and everybody was happy. So, I'll always have a soft spot for Tiger Force Psych Out. Mwah. Anyway, it's time to talk about the character now. Starting, of course, with the file cards. And I have to say, we've got some shady MK Ultra style dealings here. In case you've never heard of it, MK Ultra was a CIA project back in the 50s through the 70s where they experimented with behavior modification through chemicals and technology. It uh, has nothing to do with Mortal Kombat. Hmm, you know, I probably should stop mentioning the CIA every other episode. I don't want to end up on any more watch lists. Anyway, behavior modification was just what Psych Out's expertise was. His goal is to convince the enemy that they've lost before the battle is over. And one of the ways he tried to accomplish this was through fear and paranoia inducing low frequency radio waves. This is supposed to be one of the good guys, right? Because that's pretty evil. And that's not just me saying that, that comes straight from the comic. Yeah, these fear waves were introduced way back in the second issue of the G.I. Joe comic, where they led to the death of a Russian and American research team at the North Pole. And later, Cobra used these fear waves themselves. At least this somewhat explains all the weird crap the guy has trapped to him. All those dishes must be to send those radio waves. Not a guy you want to have standing behind you on the battlefield. The Night Force file card adds that he uses the enemy's natural fear of the dark as a weapon, explaining why a psychiatrist is on a covert strike force. And yes, he is also a counselor for the Joes. That's his secondary specialty. After the whole psychological warfare bit. His Sonic file card gives him a promotion from first lieutenant to captain, and even has a line explaining why his G.I. Joe security number is different. It was for security reasons. Well, at least his expertise with Sonic Warfare is a good reason to have him on the team that makes pew-pew noises. A better reason than Cobra being afraid of the dark, anyway. The only thing I'll mention about the European Tiger Force file card is the codename he was given in Belgium and Holland. It wasn't Psych Out. It was Psycho! Yeah, psycho. Good choice there, guys. Between this and his use of paranoia waves, are we absolutely sure he wasn't working for Cobra? 
As far as the cartoon series goes, you've already seen all there is to see in last week's review. Psych Out shows up, sucks horrendously at his job, and has one moment of competence when he figures out which of the two Hawks is the imposter. Truly an appearance that will echo through the ages. Psych Out shows up a few times in the comic, but only as a side character, really. His debut is in issue 64. If you remember, that's the same issue where Backstop made his glorious debut. And here, Psych Out is pretty much relegated to being the sidekick of Chuckles, as they investigate shenanigans going on at their base. Other times, they do make good use of the character, though. When Scarlet and Snake Eyes returned from having gone AWOL to rescue some fellow Joes, while breaking about a hundred laws and regulations, I might add, Psych Out explains that they weren't right in the head when they did that, so they shouldn't get in trouble. And also, they're just fine now. What a professional. Psych Out! I just murdered all these people because they were wearing orange t-shirts! Oh, you had diminished responsibility! Don't worry about it! And you seem fine now! Thank you, convenient plot device! His best performances happen in the special Missions comic series, where he analyzes various people in different factions to predict how they'll react to situations, allowing the Joe team to manipulate them into doing exactly what they want. Though, in one instance, he's once again the sidekick of Chuckles. Hey, you've gotta admit, if you see these two going down the street, your first thought isn't covert operations, is it? It's, once again, poorly disguised aliens. So, that was Psych Out. It should come as no surprise to you that my favorite version is the Night Force one, though I will always have a special place in my heart for the Tiger Force variant. He was used quite well in the comic, despite having a limited role. And finally, of course, his cartoon appearance makes my head hurt. See you next time, everybody!